Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for Monday, April 23rd, 2018. Let's start the tour, as we usually do, with uh, a look at the Southern Oscillation Index, the SOI. You can see here we have had a dip, a pretty good drop in the 30-day average. In fact, over the last several days, that has been the case. The 90-day average also starting to come off a little bit. What does this mean? Well, we're headed towards this neutral period, if you will, this neutral signal of the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon. And part of that gets connected back to the Southern Oscillation Index. And what does all that mean? Well, basically the pressure pattern across the tropical Pacific is changing from what we saw last year where it favored a La Nina state with strong easterly winds coming across here. The trade winds were very strong last year. We're starting to see that slacken off just a little bit with lower pressures, generally speaking, on this side of the Pacific uh, and higher pressures on the western side of the Pacific. By the way, this is a big time oversimplification. I'm just kind of showing you. So when your pressure is lower here, the net flow of air will be from west to east. Now it's not that dramatic right now because the SOI numbers are not that negative. And I'll show you another representation of this in just a moment. But it's an indication that we are absolutely leaving the La Nina state. And we can see that reflected here in the anomalies. Pretty cold here off the coast of South America near the Galapagos Islands. Relative to average, it's cold. And then, you know, you got this little ribbon of cold through here hanging on. But overall, a moderation from the La Nina pattern that we saw through last fall, especially, and in the winter. You can see the North Pacific up here, colder than average, and what we usually call the main development region, if you want to call it that. Some people say that, uh, of the Eastern Pacific, whose hurricane season actually begins in just a few weeks, May 15th. It's not that far off. Um, a little bit warmer than average overall, but nothing that is eye-opening or concerning one way or the other. That still holds true. And looking in the Atlantic Basin, the main development region here, roughly this area, yeah, for the most part, everything in that box, generally at or slightly above the long-term average. Colder up here in the Northeast Atlantic, but it's still April and none of this is really going to have an impact down the road. It's just kind of interesting to watch during the off-season. gives us something to do. And look, Remember all the talk about how warm the Gulf of Mexico was relative to average? Well, for the most part, it's cooled off in the last few days. We've had this abnormally cold spring uh, with a persistent trough and northerly flow in the eastern United States, higher pressure out west, and that has created a pattern that has basically kept cooler air draining into the lower 48, but also has kept the storm track uh, pretty active across this way and has allowed for pretty good mixing and the water temperatures have just not responded by becoming abnormally warm and if they have they've slackened off in recent days all right let's look at the subsurface now this is interesting this is my favorite el nino graphic if you will or what we call enso graphic el nino or la nina and again enso stands for el nino southern oscillation and this is the subsurface anomalies that, again, it's like a slice through the ocean. Uh, this is the eastern Pacific. This is the western Pacific. You have your longitude lines here. If they were drawn in, you know, we start here at about 90 degrees west. And we go all the way over past 140 east. So this is a vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. And then we are looking down below. And this is a large pool of warmer than normal water that's residing generally below 100 meters, which is right through here. Most of that warmth is below that. And then you see a little cold pool over here, still hanging out in the eastern Pacific. And then this dip right here, this chunk taken out of the warm pool, probably because the trade winds are still strong enough in this area to create this downwelling, um, or I'm sorry, mixing, not downwelling. Downwelling is a different story. I screwed up. Mixing keeping everything kind of churned up. That's my theory anyway, it makes sense. But what I want you to really notice here, okay, we've got this large warm pool. Uh, parts of it have come up to the surface here. This is getting ready to come to the surface. 
and there's really nothing back over here in the western Pacific. When I said downwelling before, when you get westerly winds coming across the tropics here at the surface, you help to downwell this water, push it down, that's what downwelling is, and normally the western Pacific warm pool is always there. It's always pretty warm way out in the western Pacific. Near the Philippines, you know, you get those amazing super typhoons, and that water gets downwelled or pushed down, and again, this is just for dramatic purposes to show you this, and then that water starts to move in what are called these oceanic Kelvin waves, and I know I'm starting to get into the realm of what is he talking about, but it, it's like a conveyor belt. But if something comes along and disrupts that conveyor belt, it doesn't continue. Does that make sense? And so when you have strong trades up in the eastern part of the Pacific, blowing across, you keep everything nice and mixed up here. And so you can have all the downwelling you want, but if the trade winds are strong, that warm water gets dispersed, like blowing across the top of a cup of coffee you know, or hot cocoa or whatever, right? And you cool it off or your soup, whatever. You get the idea. And there's really no large pool of downwelling induced warm water coming. This is it for now. And unless and until that happens, and in fact you see there's some colder anomalies mixed in here, there's just not that much chance of a significant El Nino. And we're almost to May. We're almost past this predictability barrier where the models really can't grasp what's going on because of interseasonal changes anyway. But anyway, this is the my graphic of choice. This sort of shows the future. Probably going to see some warming in the eastern part of the Pacific, uh, but it's not going to be very substantial because there's just not that much over ocean overall subsurface ocean warmth to contend with anyway. And this is another great example. I don't know why I haven't shown this before. This shows us a representation along the equator, which is right through here on both of these charts, right there. Pretty good straight lines, right? So this is your observed, your average observed winds through here. And these little blue arrows all blowing generally from east to west. You can see that. These are your trades, and they're blowing pretty good. All right, and then these are your anomalies down here, your departures from normal. Nothing screams out of the ordinary. You know, there's nothing that jumps off of here. These little arrows, they're not moving. Uh, when you get a large arrow like this, you're talking about you know 10 meters per second, if I understand this correct, and none of these arrows are very strong. Okay, the the longer the arrows are, the stronger the anomaly. Uh, does that make sense? And so you don't see any massive easterly wind burst down here like this or like that. And you know again, that's just for dramatic purposes. But you also in the Western Pacific over here very small amounts of westerly winds, which are anomalies. That's against the means there. We usually don't see westerly winds down in the deep tropics. Normally the trade winds are east to west, normally. And so this just continues to prove the point. Uh, and this is way out at a 180, 170 east longitude here. Really no westerly winds. And so what does that mean? There's not a mechanism blowing back this way to get all this warm water that's sitting over here naturally to downwell and fuel a potential El Nino. It's not there. And this is another piece of evidence from Dr. Mi Doctor, <laughs> Dr. Michael Ventress at uh, WSI posted this. I like this chart as well. This shows you where all of these are happening here. If you just like drew lines you know, to where they were on the map, that's how you connect these and you can see this is the beginning of the forecast here from the Euro uh, Ensemble Prediction System. And all of these blues coming up are continued easterly trades, probably above the, the average. And that's going to affect this area right through here over the next few weeks. And even in the Atlantic Basin here, you can also see maybe some stronger trades. But the strongest signal is right through here. And there are no significant westerly wind bursts coming up you see over here. These would be westerly winds, and you saw there was a lot of that several weeks ago back in March, and then it kind of dropped off and we increased the trades again. So there's just not much signal for a shift towards a substantial El Nino going into the month of May. That's the bottom line. I know I could have just said that and we would have saved 10 minutes, but 
I like being able to explain this to you because this is what I look at every day. Well, at least every week. Not quite every day yet, but there you go. All right, and then in addition, some of the guidance indicating the AMO, which is the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. Most of the guidance indicating a general trend upwards until the peak of the season, of course. So, you know, positive AMO going into the peak of the season. Nothing out of the ordinary in terms of one or two degrees uh, above in that index, the AMO index. We'll see what Dr. Phil Klotzbach, he's got a methodology for keeping track of this, but generally speaking, the different models here you can see over on the right indicating an upward trend in the AMO, which is the Atlantic uh, sea surface temperature. Well, we're in the warm phase, generally speaking, since 1995 of this AMO, and it's forecast to stay warm, but nothing alarmingly so, which is good. We don't need any hurricane seasons like last year uh, anytime soon, that's for sure. All right, actual sea surface temperatures. I showed you that the Gulf of Mexico has a few cooler anomalies. The northern Gulf along the shelf water up here still kind of chilly. The 26 degree isotherm still down in the central Gulf and in the Yucatan Channel, Bay of Campeche. Nothing out of the ordinary here. And we're moving on to the east coast of the U.S. Finally, some 25 degrees Celsius temperatures moving up through the heart of the Gulf Stream. And these gradients here, this line, these lines of equal temperatures, what we call isotherms. The gradient, which is the, in this case, the difference in temperature over distance, starting to relax a little bit. So the darkest colors are going to be north of Hatteras now, where you're separating the warm water from the cold water over a short distance. The shelf water is starting to warm up, and so we'll see this gradient relax. In other words, it won't be 45 degrees off of Wilmington in the surf and 75 in the Gulf Stream. That's the case farther north, you know, uh, south of you know the islands up here, and even parts of Hatteras. I mean, look, the Outer Banks, pretty strong gradient there. If you went offshore just 30 miles, the temperature would climb substantially in the Gulf Stream. Again, just something I like to watch, and eventually, I like it because we get to go to the beach. You know, I've got kids. I like the beach. I live in Wilmington. Wrightsville Beach is 15 minutes from my house. Yes, I'm ready for this to warm up. Let's zoom in and see what those temperatures are, actually. So looks like 16 to 17, maybe 18 Celsius. So we're still still talking about 60s, water temperatures in the 60s. Yikes. 20 degrees Celsius is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have a ways to go. All right, shifting away from the tropics, let's go to lower 48 weather. The map, watches and warnings map, generally fairly quiet today. Uh, the area to watch is going to be over here in my neck of the woods as a potent coastal storm is going to take shape. And if you notice, just right in here, there's a few areas in brown. Uh, a wind advisory is up from my neck of the woods. That should be fun tonight. And uh, the reason being, well, we've got this impressive storm system taking shape now. It brought tornadoes and severe weather across parts of the deep south and down on the Gulf Coast. You remember that dramatic video coming out of the panhandle of Florida? Well, here it is. We're going to have a lot of rainfall, which we need to ease the drought a little bit. With drought conditions, we're starting to set back in. It's going to be windy. It's going to be wet. Morning, evening commutes, etc., are all going to be nasty. I-95, if you're traveling the I-95, I didn't quite make that right. There's I-95 right there. If you're going through the I-95 corridor, be careful, I, uh, I-40 as well through the Triangle and the Triad and Highway 17. It's just going to be nasty, and it's going to be windy. So be prepared for that. Your garbage cans, don't overfill them. The garbage is going to blow everywhere, and the raccoons are going to go crazy. You don't want that. It's true. If you know about that around here, it's how it works. All right, severe weather limited over the next several days, and uh, we can look at each of these snapshots. This is day one marginal overall instability in the lower 48, uh, at least from a weather perspective. Politically, that's a different story, and a different guy can handle that. But instability, weather-wise, not a big deal today or tomorrow. Overall, hey, look, right there in my neck of the woods, marginal. So probably some rumbles of thunder, but nothing too substantial. 
And then as we get farther out into time, or is it further out into time, again, that risk is pretty small. And then the day four through eight is so small that it doesn't even show up. But I think later on in the period, we're going to change the pattern, and this area will start to see a more traditional severe weather indication or signature uh, in the coming days as we get into May. We've got to get rid of this weird spring. I think that's the biggest factor is it's just been chilly over the lower 48. And once that changes and we introduce more warm air, not that I'm wanting severe weather, I want the warm weather. But with that warm weather, we'll come to the, uh, the threat of more severe weather and the battle zone will probably start setting up out in the traditional areas of Tornado Alley as we get into May, which is naturally what's supposed to happen. So look at this. If we go through time, very heavy rainfall right here uh, across the Carolinas, the coastal Carolinas. So be mindful of that. It'll wash the pollen out of the air, but it's also going to be a lot of rain. So some flooding issues and just murky, nasty. If you don't have to work or go to school and you can just chill out, catch up on your sleep the next couple of days. As they say, good sleeping weather. But you see, yeah, another storm system coming in by Friday. Well, at least we're getting the rain. That'll keep the pollen washed away. Saw a lot of people washing their cars yesterday. I was like, man, you're just wasting your money because it's getting ready to rain pretty good. And then look, as we get beyond, well, it's about a week out, strong high pressure comes out, dominating the southeast. Very nice weather, probably a little, eh, slightly cooler than average. And then that moves offshore, and we start to get the return flow. And there you go. In the southern part of Tornado, Tornado Alley, out about uh, beyond week two, or near week two, day 10 or so, that's the signal that I was talking about. But we'll worry about that next week. Hey, look at this. It's on YouTube, parts one and parts two. Commercial free, doesn't cost you anything to watch it. But, there's always a but. If you want a hard copy, the DVD version, the entire movie all in one sitting, if you will. It's not divided into part one and two. It's like over two hours. Uh, and some bonus features, which they are going to be a surprise. I'm not going to tell you what they are. It's going to be a two-disc set. You see that right down there at the bottom? Two-disc set. Disc one is the full featured movie, the documentary of the entire 2017 Atlantic hurricane season, with obviously Harvey Irma Maria Nate being the focus. But then on disc two, some bonus features, some different material. You'll see. It's really going to be cool. These DVDs will go on sale Friday, the 27th. We're going to put it on the HurricaneTrack.com site. All of the social media will have the links for it. It'll be 30 bucks, including shipping. You can't beat that. 30 bucks for a two-disc disc set. And I'm only going to do 100 of them. That's it. Um, limited edition. You know, not many people have DVD players anymore. I won't say not many, but most of the stuff's online these days. But some people still like a hard copy. And so these will be available in limited quantities starting this Friday for $30. Watch social media, and I'll talk about it next Monday. You bet. I'll be promoting it. See if we can sell all 100 copies in no time at all, which will help to fund projects for this hurricane season reinvestment that's what we got to do all right so look for that and if you want a copy make sure you get it because once they're gone they're gone and i'm gone i'm done that's it for today i am mark sutter thanks for tuning in i always appreciate your time and attention and i also appreciate the feedback i'm getting about the documentary on youtube and elsewhere social media facebook twitter youtube really nice to see the uh, positive comments from everybody uh, it really makes me feel good that you appreciate it that much. It really is. It's a labor of love, and um, I'm proud of it. And I was watching it the other night, and I thought, well, this is pretty good, especially since I never went to film school, and I'm using a laptop to put it together. You know, it's not like I'm some, you know, Steven Spielberg or whatever, or uh, a you know documentary filmmaker, you know, by trade. And I'm rambling here, I know, but I do appreciate your support on it. The comments are very positive. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your week. Stay dry out there if you're in the southeast part of the country. It's going to be a wet couple of days ahead. Like I said, sleep in if you can and enjoy it. I'm Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks for watching. We'll talk again next Monday.